Section 1 of Discourse on Metaphysics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Discourse on Metaphysics by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Translated by George Montgomery. Section 1. 1. Concerning the divine perfection and that God does everything in the most desirable way. The conception of God which is the most common and the most full of meaning is expressed well enough in the words, God is an absolutely perfect being. The implications, however, of these words fail to receive sufficient consideration. For instance, there are many different kinds of perfection, all of which God possesses, and each one of them pertains to him in the highest degree. We must also know what perfection is. One thing which can surely be affirmed about it is that those forms or natures which are not susceptible of it to the highest degree, say the nature of numbers or of figures, do not permit of perfection. This is because the number which is the greatest of all, that is, the sum of all the numbers, and likewise the greatest of all figures, imply contradictions. The greatest knowledge, however, and omnipotence contain no impossibility. Consequently, power and knowledge do admit of perfection, and in so far as they pertain to God, they have no limits. Whence it follows that God, who possesses supreme and infinite wisdom, acts in the most perfect manner, not only metaphysically, but also from the moral standpoint. And with respect to ourselves, it can be said that the more we are enlightened and informed in regard to the works of God, the more will we be disposed to find them excellent and conforming entirely to that which we might desire. 2. Against those who hold that there is in the works of God no goodness, or that the principles of goodness and beauty are arbitrary. Therefore I am far removed from the opinion of those who maintain that there are no principles of goodness or perfection in the nature of things, or in the ideas which God has about them, and who say that the works of God are good only through the formal reason that God has made them. If this position were true, God, knowing that he is the author of things, would not have to regard them afterwards and find them good, as the Holy Scripture witnesses. Such anthropological expressions are used only to let us know that excellence is recognized in regarding the works themselves, even if we do not consider their evident dependence on their author. This is confirmed by the fact that it is in reflecting upon the works that we are able to discover the one who wrought. They must therefore bear in themselves his character. I confess that the contrary opinion seems to me extremely dangerous and closely approaches that of recent innovators who hold that the beauty of the universe and the goodness which we attribute to the works of God are chimeras of human beings who think of God in human terms. In saying, therefore, that things are not good according to any standard of goodness, but simply by the will of God, it seems to me that one destroys, without realizing it, all the love of God and all his glory. For why praise him for what he has done? if he would be equally praiseworthy in doing the contrary. Where will be his justice and his wisdom if he has only a certain despotic power, if arbitrary will takes the place of reasonableness, and if in accord with the definition of tyrants, justice consists in that which is pleasing to the most powerful? Besides, it seems that every act of willing supposes some reason for the willing, and this reason, of course, must precede the act. This is why, accordingly, I find so strange those expressions of certain philosophers who say that the eternal truths of metaphysics and geometry, and consequently the principles of goodness, of justice, and of perfection, are effects only of the will of God. To me it seems that all these follow from his understanding, which does not depend upon his will any more than does his essence. 3. Against those who think that God might have made things better than he has. No more am I able to approve of the opinion of certain modern writers who boldly maintain that that which God has made is not perfect in the highest degree, and that he might have done better. It seems to me that the consequences of such an opinion are wholly inconsistent with the glory of God. Uti minus malum habet rationem boni, ita minus bonum habet rationem mali. I think that one acts imperfectly if he acts with less perfection than he is capable of. To show that an architect could have done better is to find fault with his work. Furthermore, this opinion is contrary to the Holy Scriptures when they assure us of the goodness of God's work. For if comparative perfection were sufficient, then in whatever way God accomplished his work, since there is an infinitude of possible imperfections, it would always have been good in comparison with the less perfect. 
but a thing is little praiseworthy when it can be praised only in this way. I believe that a great many passages from the divine writings and from the Holy Fathers will be found favouring my position, while hardly any will be found in favour of that of these modern thinkers. Their opinion is, in my judgment, unknown to the writers of antiquity, and is a deduction based upon the too slight acquaintance which we have with the general harmony of the universe and with the hidden reasons for God's conduct. In our ignorance, therefore, we are tempted to decide audaciously that many things might have been done better. These modern thinkers insist upon certain hardly tenable subtleties, for they imagine that nothing is so perfect that there might not have been something more perfect. This is an error. They think, indeed, that they are thus safeguarding the liberty of God. As if it were not the highest liberty to act in perfection according to the sovereign reason. For to think that God acts in anything without having any reason for his willing, even if we overlook the fact that such action seems impossible, is an opinion which conforms little to God's glory. For example, let us suppose that God chooses between A and B, and that he takes A without any reason for preferring it to B. I say that this action on the part of God is at least not praiseworthy, for all praise ought to be founded upon reason which ex hypothesi is not present here. My opinion is that God does nothing for which he does not deserve to be glorified. 4. That love for God demands on our part complete satisfaction with and acquiescence in that which he has done. The general knowledge of this great truth that God acts always in the most perfect and most desirable manner possible is in my opinion the basis of the love which we owe to God in all things. For he who loves seeks his satisfaction in the felicity or perfection of the object loved and in the perfection of his actions. Idem vele et idem nole, vera amicitia est. I believe that it is difficult to love God truly when one, having the power to change his disposition, is not disposed to wish for that which God desires. In fact, those who are not satisfied with what God does seem to me like dissatisfied subjects whose attitude is not very different from that of rebels. I hold, therefore, that on these principles, to act conformably to the love of God, it is not sufficient to force oneself to be patient. We must be really satisfied with all that comes to us according to his will. I mean this acquiescence in regard to the past, for as regards the future, one should not be a quietist with the arms folded, open to ridicule, awaiting that which God will do. According to the sophism which the ancients called Logos Aergop, the lazy reason, it is necessary to act conformably to the presumptive will of God as far as we are able to judge of it, trying with all our might to contribute to the general welfare, and particularly to the ornamentation and to the perfection of that which touches us, or of that which is nigh and, so to speak, at our hand. For if the future shall perhaps show that God has not wished our good intention to have its way, it does not follow that he has not wished us to act as we have. On the contrary, since he is the best of all masters, he ever demands only the right intentions, and it is for him to know the hour and the proper place to let good designs succeed. 5. In what the principles of the divine perfection consist, and that the simplicity of the means counterbalances the richness of the effects. It is sufficient, therefore, to have this confidence in God, that he has done everything for the best, and that nothing will be able to injure those who love him. To know in particular, however, the reasons which have moved him to choose this order of the universe, to permit sin, to dispense his salutary grace in a certain manner, this passes the capacity of a finite mind, above all when such a mind has not come into the joy of the vision of God. Yet it is possible to make some general remarks touching the course of providence in the government of things. One is able to say, therefore, that he who acts perfectly is like an excellent geometer, who knows how to find the best construction for a problem, like a good architect who utilizes his location and the funds destined for the building in the most advantageous manner, leaving nothing which shocks or which does not display that beauty of which it is capable, like a good householder who employs his property in such a way that there shall be nothing uncultivated or sterile, like a clever machinist who makes his production in the least difficult way possible and like an intelligent author who encloses the most of reality in the least possible compass. Of all beings, those which are the most perfect and occupy the least possible space, that is to say, those which interfere with one another the least, are the spirits whose perfections are the virtues. 
that is why we may not doubt that the felicity of the spirits is the principal aim of god and that he puts this purpose into execution as far as the general harmony will permit we will recur to this subject again when the simplicity of god's way is spoken of reference is specially made to the means which he employs and on the other hand when the variety richness and abundance are referred to the ends or effects are had in mind thus one ought to be proportioned to the other just as the cost of a building should balance the beauty and grandeur which is expected it is true that nothing costs god anything just as there is no cost for a philosopher who makes hypotheses in constructing his imaginary world because god has only to make decrees in order that a real world come into being but in matters of wisdom the decrees or hypotheses meet the expenditure in proportion as they are more independent of one another the reason wishes to avoid multiplicity in hypotheses or principles very much as the simplest system is preferred in astronomy six that god does nothing which is not orderly and that it is not even possible to conceive of events which are not regular the activities or the acts of will of god are commonly divided into ordinary and extraordinary but it is well to bear in mind that god does nothing out of order therefore that which passes for extraordinary is so only with regard to a particular order established among the created things for as regards the universal order everything conforms to it this is so true that not only does nothing occur in this world which is absolutely irregular but it is even impossible to conceive of such an occurrence because let us suppose for example that someone jots down a quantity of points upon a sheet of paper helter-skelter as do those who exercise the ridiculous art of geomancy now i say that it is possible to find a geometrical line whose concept shall be uniform and constant that is in accordance with a certain formula and which line at the same time shall pass through all of those points and in the same order in which the hand jotted them down also if a continuous line be traced which is now straight now circular and now of any other description it is possible to find a mental equivalent a formula or an equation common to all the points of this line by virtue of which formula the changes in the direction of the line must occur there is no instance of a face whose contour does not form part of a geometric line and which cannot be traced entire by a certain mathematical motion but when the formula is very complex that which conforms to it passes for irregular thus we may say that in whatever manner god might have created the world it would always have been regular and in a certain order god however has chosen the most perfect that is to say the one which is at the same time the simplest in hypotheses and the richest in phenomena as might be the case with a geometric line whose construction was easy but whose properties and effects were extremely remarkable and of great significance i use these comparisons to picture a certain imperfect resemblance to the divine wisdom and to point out that which may at least raise our minds to conceive in some sort what cannot otherwise be expressed i do not pretend at all to explain thus the great mystery upon which depends the whole universe seven that miracles conform to the regular order although they go against the subordinate regulations concerning that which god desires or permits and concerning general and particular intentions now since nothing is done which is not orderly we may say that miracles are quite within the order of natural operations we use the term natural of these operations because they conform to certain subordinate regulations which we call the nature of things for it can be said that this nature is only a custom of god's which he can change on the occasion of a stronger reason than that which moved him to use these regulations as regards general and particular intentions according to the way in which we understand the matter it may be said on the one hand that everything is in accordance with his most general intention or that which best conforms to the most perfect order he has chosen on the other hand however it is also possible to say that he has particular intentions which are exceptions to the subordinate regulations above mentioned of god's laws however the most universal that is that which rules the whole course of the universe is without exceptions it is possible to say that god desires everything which is an object of his particular intention when we consider the objects of his general intentions however such as are the modes of activities of created things and especially of the reasoning creatures with whom god wishes to cooperate we must make a distinction for if the action is good in itself we may say that god wishes it and at times commands it even though it does not take place but if it is bad in itself and becomes good only by accident through the course of events 
and especially after chastisement and satisfaction have corrected its malignity and rewarded the ill with interest in such a way that more perfection results in the whole train of circumstances than would have come if that ill had not occurred if all this takes place we must say that god permits the evil and not that he desired it although he has cooperated by means of the laws of nature which he has established he knows how to produce the greatest good from them eight in order to distinguish between the activities of god and the activities of created things we must explain the conception of an individual substance it is quite difficult to distinguish god's actions from those of his creatures some think that god does everything others imagine that he only conserves the force which he has given to created things how far can we say either of these opinions is right in the first place since activity and passivity pertain properly to individual substances actiones sunt suppositorum it will be necessary to explain what such a substance is it is indeed true that when several predicates are attributes of a single subject and this subject is not an attribute of another we speak of it as an individual substance but this is not enough and such an explanation is merely nominal we must therefore inquire what it is to be an attribute in reality of a certain subject now it is evident that every true predication has some basis in the nature of things and even when a proposition is not identical that is when the predicate is not expressly contained in the subject it is still necessary that it be virtually contained in it and this is what the philosophers call in esse saying thereby that the predicate is in the subject thus the content of the subject must always include that of the predicate in such a way that if one understands perfectly the concept of the subject he will know that the predicate appertains to it also this being so we are able to say that this is the nature of an individual substance or of a complete being namely to afford a conception so complete that the concept shall be sufficient for the understanding of it and for the deduction of all the predicates of which the substance is or may become the subject thus the quality of king which belonged to alexander the great an abstraction from the subject is not sufficiently determined to constitute an individual and does not contain the other qualities of the same subject nor everything which the idea of this prince includes god however seeing the individual concept or hexaity of alexander sees there at the same time the basis and the reason of all the predicates which can be truly uttered regarding him for instance that he will conquer darius and porus even to the point of knowing a priori and not by experience whether he died a natural death or by poison facts which we can learn only through history when we carefully consider the connection of things we see also the possibility of saying that there was always in the soul of alexander marks of all that had happened to him and evidences of all that would happen to him and traces even of everything which occurs in the universe although god alone could recognize them all nine that every individual substance expresses the whole universe in its own manner and that in its full concept is included all its experiences together with all the attendant circumstances and the whole sequence of exterior events there follow from these considerations several noticeable paradoxes among others that it is not true that two substances may be exactly alike and differ only numerically solo numero and that what st thomas says on this point regarding angels and intelligences quod ibi omne individuum sit species infima is true of all substances provided that the specific difference is understood as geometers understand it in the case of figures again that a substance will be able to commence only through creation and perish only through annihilation that a substance cannot be divided into two nor can one be made out of two and that thus the number of substances neither augments nor diminishes through natural means although they are frequently transformed furthermore every substance is like an entire world and like a mirror of god or indeed of the whole world which it portrays each one in its own fashion almost as the same city is variously represented according to the various situations of him who is regarding it thus the universe is multiplied in some sort as many times as there are substances and the glory of god is multiplied in the same way by as many wholly different representations of his works it can indeed be said that every substance bears in some sort the character of god's infinite wisdom and omnipotence and imitates him as much as it is able to for it expresses although confusedly all that happens in the universe past present and future deriving thus a certain resemblance to an infinite perception or power of knowledge 
and since all other substances express this particular substance and accommodate themselves to it, we can say that it exerts its power upon all the others in imitation of the omnipotence of the Creator. 10. That the belief in substantial forms has a certain basis in fact, but that these forms effect no changes in the phenomena and must not be employed for the explanation of particular events. It seems that the ancients, able men, who were accustomed to profound meditations and taught theology and philosophy for several centuries, and some of whom recommend themselves to us on account of their piety, had some knowledge of that which we have just said, and this is why they introduced and maintained the substantial forms so much decried today. But they were not so far from the truth, nor so open to ridicule as the common run of our new philosophers imagine. I grant that the consideration of these forms is of no service in the details of physics, and ought not to be employed in the explanation of particular phenomena. In regard to this last point, the schoolmen were at fault, as were also the physicians of times past who followed their example, thinking they had given the reason for the properties of a body in mentioning the forms and qualities, without going to the trouble of examining the manner of operation. As if one should be content to say that a clock had a certain amount of clockness derived from its form, and should not inquire in what that clockness consisted. This is indeed enough for the man who buys it, provided he surrenders the care of it to someone else. The fact, however, that there was this misunderstanding and misuse of the substantial forms should not bring us to throw away something whose recognition is so necessary in metaphysics. Since without these we will not be able, I hold, to know the ultimate principles, nor to lift our minds to the knowledge of the incorporeal natures and of the marvels of God. Yet as the geometer does not need to encumber his mind with the famous puzzle of the composition of the continuum, and as no moralist, and still less a jurist or a statesman, has need to trouble himself with the great difficulties which arise in conciliating free will with the providential activity of God, since the geometer is able to make all his demonstrations, and the statesman can complete all his deliberations without entering into these discussions which are so necessary and important in philosophy and theology, so in the same way the physicist can explain his experiments, now using simpler experiments already made, now employing geometrical and mechanical demonstrations, without any need of the general considerations which belong to another sphere, and if he employs the cooperation of God, or perhaps of some soul or animating force, or something else of a similar nature, he goes out of his path quite as much as that man who, when facing an important practical question, would wish to enter into profound argumentations regarding the nature of destiny and of our liberty, a fault which men quite frequently commit without realizing it when they cumber their minds with considerations regarding fate, and thus they are even sometimes turned from a good resolution or from some necessary provision. 11. That the opinions of the theologians and of the so-called scholastic philosophers are not to be wholly despised. I know that I am advancing a great paradox in pretending to resuscitate in some sort the ancient philosophy, and to recall post liminio the substantial forms almost banished from our modern thought. But perhaps I will not be condemned lightly when it is known that I have long meditated over the modern philosophy, and that I have devoted much time to experiments in physics and to the demonstrations of geometry, and that I too for a long time was persuaded of the baselessness of those beings which, however, I was finally obliged to take up again in spite of myself, and as though by force. The many investigations which I carried on compelled me to recognize that our moderns do not do sufficient justice to St. Thomas and to the other great men of that period, and that there is in the theories of the scholastic philosophers and theologians far more solidity than is imagined, provided that these theories are employed a propos and in their place. I am persuaded that if some careful and meditative mind were to take the trouble to clarify and direct their thoughts in the manner of analytic geometers, he would find a great treasure of very important truths, wholly demonstrable. 12. That the conception of the extension of a body is in a way imaginary and does not constitute the substance of the body. But to resume the thread of our discussion, I believe that he who will meditate upon the nature of substance, as I have explained it above, will find that the whole nature of bodies is not exhausted in their extension, that is to say, in their size, figure and motion, but that we must recognize something which corresponds to soul, something which is commonly called substantial form, although these forms effect no change in the phenomena, any more than do the souls of beasts, that is, if they have souls. 
It is even possible to demonstrate that the ideas of size, figure and motion are not so distinctive as is imagined, and that they stand for something imaginary relative to our perceptions as do, although to a greater extent, the ideas of colour, heat and the other similar qualities, in regard to which we may doubt whether they are actually to be found in the nature of things outside us. This is why these latter qualities are unable to constitute substance, and if there is no other principle of identity in bodies than that which has just been referred to, a body would not subsist more than for a moment. The souls and the substance forms of other bodies are entirely different from intelligent souls, which alone know their actions, and not only do not perish through natural means, but indeed always retain the knowledge of what they are, a fact which makes them alone open to chastisement or recompense and makes them citizens of the republic of the universe whose monarch is god hence it follows that all the other creatures should serve them a point which we shall discuss more amply later thirteen as the individual concept of each person includes once for all everything which can ever happen to him in it can be seen a priori the evidences or the reasons for the reality of each event and why one happened sooner than the other but these events, however certain, are nevertheless contingent, being based on the free choice of God and of his creatures. It is true that their choices always have their reasons, but they incline to the choices under no compulsion of necessity. But before going further, it is necessary to meet a difficulty which may arise regarding the principles which we have set forth in the preceding. We have said that the concept of an individual substance includes once for all everything which can ever happen to it, and that in considering this concept one will be able to see everything which can truly be said concerning the individual, just as we are able to see in the nature of a circle all the properties which can be derived from it. But does it not seem that in this way the difference between contingent and necessary truths will be destroyed, that there will be no place for human liberty, and that an absolute fatality will rule as well over all our actions as over all the rest of the events of the world? To this I reply that a distinction must be made between that which is certain and that which is necessary. Everyone grants that future contingencies are assured since God foresees them, but we do not say just because of that that they are necessary. But it will be objected that if any conclusion can be deduced infallibly from some definition or concept, it is necessary. And now since we have maintained that everything which is to happen to anyone is already virtually included in his nature or concept, as all the properties are contained in the definition of a circle, therefore the difficulty still remains. In order to meet the objection completely, I say that the connection or sequences of two kinds, the one, absolutely necessary, whose contrary implies contradiction, occurs in the eternal verities like the truths of geometry. The other is necessary only ex hypothesi, and so to speak by accident, and in itself it is contingent since the contrary is not implied. This latter sequence is not founded upon ideas wholly pure and upon the pure understanding of God, but upon his free decrees and upon the processes of the universe. Let us give an example. Since Julius Caesar will become perpetual dictator and master of the Republic, and will overthrow the liberty of Rome, this action is contained in his concept, for we have supposed that it is in the nature of such a perfect concept of a subject to involve everything, in fact, so that the predicate may be included in the subject ut posit in esse subjecto. We may say that it is not in virtue of this concept or idea that he is obliged to perform this action, since it pertains to him only because God knows everything. But it will be insisted in reply that his nature or form responds to this concept, and since God imposes upon him this personality, he is compelled henceforth to live up to it. I could reply by instancing the similar case of the future contingencies which as yet have no reality save in the understanding and will of God, and which, because God has given them in advance this form, must needs correspond to it. But I prefer to overcome a difficulty rather than to excuse it by instancing other difficulties, and what I am about to say will serve to clear up the one as well as the other. It is here that must be applied the distinction in the kind of relation, and I say that that which happens conformably to these decrees is assured, but that it is not therefore necessary, and if any one did the contrary, he would do nothing impossible in itself, although it is impossible ex hypothesi that that other happen. For if any one were capable of carrying out a complete demonstration by virtue of which he could prove this connection of the subject, which is Caesar, with the predicate, 
which is his successful enterprise he would bring us to see in fact that the future dictatorship of caesar had its basis in his concept or nature so that one would see there a reason why he resolved to cross the rubicon rather than to stop and why he gained instead of losing the day at pharsalus and that it was reasonable and by consequence assured that this would occur but one would not prove that it was necessary in itself nor that the contrary implied a contradiction almost in the same way in which it is reasonable and assured that god will always do what is best although that which is less perfect is not thereby implied for it would be found that this demonstration of this predicate as belonging to caesar is not as absolute as are those of numbers or of geometry but that this predicate supposes a sequence of things which god has shown by his free will this sequence is based on the first free decree of God, which was to do always that which is the most perfect, and upon the decree which God made following the first one, regarding human nature, which is that men should always do, although freely, that which appears to be the best. Now every truth which is founded upon this kind of decree is contingent, although certain, for the decrees of God do not change the possibilities of things. And, as I have already said, although God assuredly chooses the best, this does not prevent that which is less perfect from being possible in itself. Although it will never happen, it is not its impossibility but its imperfection which causes him to reject it. Now nothing is necessitated whose opposite is possible. One will then be in a position to satisfy these kinds of difficulties, however great they may appear, and in fact they have not been less vexing to all other thinkers who have ever treated this matter provided that he considers well that all contingent propositions have reasons why they are thus, rather than otherwise, or indeed, what is the same thing, that they have proof a priori of their truth, which render them certain and show that the connection of the subject and predicate in these propositions has its basis in the nature of the one and of the other. But he must further remember that such contingent propositions have not the demonstrations of necessity, since their reasons are founded only on the principle of contingency, or of the existence of things that is to say, upon that which is, or which appears to be the best among several things equally possible. Necessary truths, on the other hand, are founded upon the principle of contradiction, and upon the possibility or impossibility of the essences themselves, without regard here to the free will of God or of creatures. 14. God produces different substances according to the different views which he has of the world, and by the intervention of God, the appropriate nature of each substance brings it about that what happens to one corresponds to what happens to all the others, without, however, their acting upon one another directly. After having seen, to a certain extent, in what the nature of substances consists, we must try to explain the dependence they have upon one another, and their actions and passions. Now it is first of all very evident that created substances depend upon God, who preserves them and can produce them continually, by a kind of emanation just as we produce our thoughts for when god turns so to say on all sides and in all fashions the general system of phenomena which he finds it good to produce for the sake of manifesting his glory and when he regards all the aspects of the world in all possible manners since there is no relation which escapes his omniscience the result of each view of the universe as seen from a different position is a substance which expresses the universe conformably to this view provided God sees fit to render his thought effective and to produce the substance. And since God's vision is always true, our perceptions are always true, and that which deceives us are our judgments, which are of us. Now we have said before, and it follows from what we have just said, that each substance is a world by itself, independent of everything else excepting God. Therefore all our phenomena, that is all things which are ever able to happen to us, are only consequences of our being. Now as the phenomena maintain a certain order conformably to our nature, or so to speak to the world which is in us, from whence it follows that we can, for the regulation of our conduct, make useful observations which are justified by the outcome of the future phenomena, and as we are thus able often to judge the future by the past without deceiving ourselves, we have sufficient grounds for saying that these phenomena are true, and we will not be put to the task of inquiring whether they are outside of us, and whether others perceive them also. Nevertheless, it is most true that the perceptions and expressions of all substances intercorrespond, so that each one following independently certain reasons or laws which he has noticed meets others which are doing the same, as when several have agreed to meet together in a certain place on a set day. They are able to carry out the plan if they wish. 
Now, although all express the same phenomena, this does not bring it about that their expressions are exactly alike. It is sufficient if they are proportional. As when several spectators think they see the same thing and are agreed about it, although each one sees or speaks according to the measure of his vision. It is God alone, from whom all individuals emanate continually, and who sees the universe not only as they see it, but besides in a very different way from them, who is the cause of this correspondence in their phenomena, and who brings it about that that which is particular to one is also common to all, otherwise there would be no relation. In a way, then, we might properly say, although it seems strange, that a particular substance never acts upon another particular substance, nor is it acted upon by it. That which happens to each one is only the consequence of its complete idea or concept, since this idea already includes all the predicates and expresses the whole universe. In fact, nothing can happen to us except thoughts and perceptions, and all our thoughts and perceptions are but the consequence, contingent it is true, of our precedent thoughts and perceptions in such a way that were I able to consider directly all that happens or appears to me at the present time, I should be able to see all that will happen to me or that will ever appear to me. This future will not fail me and will surely appear to me even if all that which is outside of me were destroyed, save only that God and myself were left. Since, however, we ordinarily attribute to other things an action upon us which brings us to perceive things in a certain manner, it is necessary to consider the basis of this judgment and to inquire what there is of truth in it. 15. The action of one finite substance upon another consists only in the increase in the degrees of the expression of the first, combined with a decrease in that of the second, in so far as God has in advance fashioned them so that they will act in accord. Without entering into a long discussion, it is sufficient for reconciling the language of metaphysics with that of practical life to remark that we preferably attribute to ourselves, and with reason, the phenomena which we express the most perfectly, and that we attribute to other substances those phenomena which each one expresses the best. Thus a substance which is of an infinite extension in so far as it expresses all, becomes limited in proportion to its more or less perfect manner of expression. It is thus then that we may conceive of substances as interfering with and limiting one another, and hence we are able to say that in this sense they act upon one another, and that they, so to speak, accommodate themselves to one another. For it can happen that a single change which augments the expression of the one may diminish that of the other. Now the virtue of a particular substance is to express well the glory of God, and the better it expresses it, the less is it limited. Everything when it expresses its virtue or power, that is to say, when it acts, changes to better, and expands just in so far as it acts. When therefore a change occurs by which several substances are affected, in fact, every change affects them all. I think we may say that those substances, which by this change pass immediately to a greater degree of perfection, or to a more perfect expression, exert power and act, while those which pass to a lesser degree disclose their weakness and suffer. I also hold that every activity of a substance which has perception implies some pleasure, and every passion some pain, except that it may very well happen that a present advantage will be eventually destroyed by a greater evil whence it comes that one may sin in acting or exerting his power and in finding pleasure. 16. The extraordinary intervention of God is not excluded in that which our particular essences express, because their expression includes everything. Such intervention, however, goes beyond the power of our natural being or of our distinct expression, because these are finite and follow certain subordinate regulations. There remains for us at present only to explain how it is possible that God has influence at times upon men or upon other substances by an extraordinary or miraculous intervention, since it seems that nothing is able to happen which is extraordinary or supernatural, inasmuch as all the events which occur to the other substances are only the consequences of their natures. We must recall what was said above in regard to the miracles in the universe. These always conform to the universal law of the general order, although they may contravene the subordinate regulations, and since every person or substance is like a little world which expresses the great world, we can say that this extraordinary action of God upon this substance is nevertheless miraculous, although it is comprised in the general order of the universe insofar as it is expressed by the individual essence or concept of this substance. This is why, if we understand in our natures all that they express, nothing is supernatural in them, because they reach out to everything, an effect always expressing its cause, and God being the veritable cause of the substances. 
but as that which our natures express the most perfectly pertains to them in a particular manner, that being their special power, and since they are limited, as I have just explained, many things there are which surpass the powers of our natures and even of all limited natures. As a consequence, to speak more clearly, I say that the miracles and the extraordinary interventions of God have this peculiarity, that they cannot be foreseen by any created mind, however enlightened. This is because the distinct comprehension of the fundamental order surpasses them all, while on the other hand, that which is called natural depends upon less fundamental regulations, which the creatures are able to understand. In order then that my words may be as irreprehensible as the meaning I am trying to convey, it will be well to associate certain words with certain significations. We may call that which includes everything that we express and which expresses our union with God himself, nothing going beyond it, our essence. But that which is limited in us may be designated as our nature or our power, and in accordance with this terminology, that which goes beyond the natures of all created substances is supernatural. 17. An example of a subordinate regulation in the law of nature which demonstrates that God always preserves the same amount of force, but not the same quantity of motion, against the Cartesians and many others. I have frequently spoken of subordinate regulations, or of the laws of nature, and it seems that it will be well to give an example. Our new philosophers are unanimous in employing that famous law that God always preserves the same amount of motion in the universe. In fact, it is a very plausible law, and in times past I held it for indubitable. But since then I have learned in what its fault consists. Monsieur Descartes and many other clever mathematicians have thought that the quantity of motion, that is to say the velocity multiplied by the mass of the moving body, is exactly equivalent to the moving force, or to speak in mathematical terms, that the force varies as the velocity multiplied by the mass. Footnote on mass. This term is employed here for the sake of clearness. Leibniz did not possess the concept mass, which was enunciated by Newton in the same year in which the present treatise was written, 1686. Leibniz uses the terms body, magnitude of body, etc. The technical expression mass occurs once only in the writings of Leibniz, in a treatise published in 1695, and was there doubtless borrowed from Newton. For the history of the controversy concerning the Cartesian and Leibnizian measure of force, see Marx's Science of Mechanics, Chicago, 1893, pages 272 et sec. Translator. Now it is reasonable that the same force is always preserved in the universe. So also, looking to phenomena, it will be readily seen that a mechanical perpetual motion is impossible, because the force in such a machine, being always diminished a little by friction and so ultimately destined to be entirely spent, would necessarily have to recoup its losses, and consequently would keep on increasing of itself without any new impulsion from without. And we see furthermore that the force of a body is diminished only in the proportion as it gives up force, either to a contiguous body or to its own parts, in so far as they have a separate movement. The mathematicians to whom I have referred think that what can be said of force can be said of the quantity of motion. In order, however, to show the difference, I make two suppositions. In the first place, that a body falling from a certain height acquires a force enabling it to remount to the same height, provided that its direction is turned that way, or provided that there are no hindrances. For instance, a pendulum will rise exactly to the height from which it has fallen, provided the resistance of the air and of certain other small particles do not diminish a little its acquired force. I suppose, in the second place, that it will take as much force to lift a body A, weighing one pound, to the height CD, four feet, as to raise a body B, weighing four pounds, to the height EF, one foot. These two suppositions are granted by our new philosophers. It is therefore manifest that the body A, falling from the height CD, acquires exactly as much force as the body B, falling from the height EF, for the body B at F, having by the first supposition sufficient force to return to E, has therefore the force to carry a body of four pounds to the distance of one foot, EF. And likewise the body A at D, having the force to return to C, has also the force required to carry a body weighing one pound, its own weight, back to C, a distance of four feet. Now by the second supposition the force of these two bodies is equal. Let us now see if the quantity of motion is the same in each case. It is here that we will be surprised to find a very great difference, for it has been proved by Galileo that the velocity acquired by the fall CD is double the velocity acquired by the fall EF, although the height is four times as great. 
multiplying therefore the body a whose mass is one by its velocity which is two the product or the quantity of movement will be two and on the other hand if we multiply the body b whose mass is four by its velocity which is one the product or quantity of motion will be four hence the quantity of the motion of the body a at the point d is half the quantity of the motion of the body b at the point f yet their forces are equal and there is therefore a great difference between the quantity of motion and the force this is what we set out to show we can see therefore how the force ought to be estimated by the quantity of the effect which it is able to produce for example by the height to which a body of certain weight can be raised this is a very different thing from the velocity which can be imparted to it and in order to impart to it double the velocity we must have double the force nothing is simpler than this proof and m descartes has fallen into error here only because he trusted too much to his thoughts even when they had not been ripened by reflection but it astonishes me that his disciples have not noticed this error and i am afraid that they are beginning to imitate little by little certain peripatetics whom they ridicule and that they are accustoming themselves to consult rather the books of their master than reason or nature eighteen the distinction between force and the quantity of motion is among other reasons important as showing that we must have recourse to metaphysical considerations in addition to discussions of extension if we wish to explain the phenomena of matter this consideration of the force distinguished from the quantity of motion is of importance not only in physics and mechanics for finding the real laws of nature and the principles of motion and even for correcting many practical errors which have crept into the writings of certain able mathematicians but also in metaphysics it is of importance for the better understanding of principles because motion if we regard only its exact and formal meaning that is change of place is not something entirely real and when several bodies change their places reciprocally it is not possible to determine by considering the bodies alone to which among them movement or repose is to be attributed as i could demonstrate geometrically if i wished to stop for it now but the force or the proximate cause of these changes is something more real and there are sufficient grounds for attributing it to one body rather than to another and it is only through this latter investigation that we can determine to which one the movement must appertain now this force is something different from size from form or from motion and it can be seen from this consideration that the whole meaning of a body is not exhausted in its extension together with its modifications as our moderns persuade themselves we are therefore obliged to restore certain beings or forms which they have banished it appears more and more clear that although all the particular phenomena of nature can be explained mathematically or mechanically by those who understand them yet nevertheless the general principles of corporeal nature and even of mechanics are metaphysical rather than geometric and belong rather to certain indivisible forms or natures as the causes of the appearances than to the corporeal mass or to extension this reflection is able to reconcile the mechanical philosophy of the moderns with the circumspection of those intelligent and well-meaning persons who with a certain justice fear that we are becoming too far removed from immaterial beings and that we are thus prejudicing piety End of section 1section two of discourse on metaphysics this librivox recording is in the public domain discourse on metaphysics by gottfried wilhelm leibniz translated by george montgomery section two nineteen the utility of final causes in physics as i do not wish to judge people in ill part i bring no accusation against our new philosophers who pretend to banish final causes from physics but i am nevertheless obliged to avow that the consequences of such a banishment appear to me dangerous especially when joined to that position which i refuted at the beginning of this treatise that position seemed to go the length of discarding final causes entirely as though god proposed no end and no good in his activity or as if good were not to be the object of his will i hold on the contrary that it is just in this that the principle of all existences and of the laws of nature must be sought hence god always proposes the best and most perfect i am quite willing to grant that we are liable to err when we wish to determine the purposes or counsels of god but this is the case only when we try to limit them to some particular design thinking that he has had in view only a single thing while in fact he regards everything at once as for instance if we think that god has made the world only for us it is a great blunder although it may be quite true that he has made it entirely for us 
and that there is nothing in the universe which does not touch us and which does not accommodate itself to the regard which he has for us according to the principle laid down above therefore when we see some good effect or some perfection which happens or which follows from the works of god we are able to say assuredly that god has purposed it for he does nothing by chance and is not like us who sometimes fail to do well therefore far from being able to fall into error in this respect as do the extreme statesmen who postulate too much foresight in the designs of princes or as do commentators who seek for too much erudition in their authors it will be impossible to attribute too much reflection to god's infinite wisdom and there is no matter in which error is less to be feared provided we confine ourselves to affirmations than provided we avoid negative statements which limit the designs of god all those who see the admirable structure of animals find themselves led to recognize the wisdom of the author of things and I advise those who have any sentiment of piety and indeed of true philosophy to hold aloof from the expressions of certain pretentious minds who instead of saying that eyes were made for seeing say that we see because we find ourselves having eyes. When one seriously holds such opinions which hand everything over to material necessity or to a kind of chance, although either alternative ought to appear ridiculous to those who understand what we have explained above, it is difficult to recognize an intelligent author of nature the effect should correspond to its cause and indeed it is best known through the recognition of its cause so that it is reasonable to introduce a sovereign intelligence ordering things and in place of making use of the wisdom of this sovereign being to employ only the properties of matter to explain phenomena as if in order to account for the capture of an important place by a prince the historian should say that it was because the particles of powder in the cannon having been touched by a spark of fire expanded with a rapidity capable of pushing a hard solid body against the walls of the place while the little particles which composed the brass of the cannon were so well interlaced that they did not separate under this impact as if he should account for it in this way instead of making us see how the foresight of the conqueror brought him to choose the time and the proper means and how his ability surmounted all obstacles twenty a noteworthy disquisition in plato's phaedo against the philosophers who were too materialistic this reminds me of a fine disquisition by socrates in plato's phaedo which agrees perfectly with my opinion on this subject and seems to have been uttered expressly for our too materialistic philosophers this agreement has led me to a desire to translate it although it is a little long perhaps this example will give some of us an incentive to share in many of the other beautiful and well-balanced thoughts which are found in the writings of this famous author footnote there is a gap here in the manuscript intended for the passage from plato the translation of which leibniz did not supply translator twenty one if the mechanical laws depended upon geometry alone without metaphysical influences the phenomena would be very different from what they are now since the wisdom of god has always been recognized in the detail of the mechanical structures of certain particular bodies it should also be shown in the general economy of the world and in the constitution of the laws of nature this is so true that even in the laws of motion in general the plans of this wisdom have been noticed for if bodies were only extended masses and motion were only a change of place and if everything ought to be and could be deduced by geometric necessity from these two definitions alone it would follow as i have shown elsewhere that the smallest body on contact with a very large one at rest would impart to it its own velocity and yet without losing any of the velocity that it had a quantity of other rules wholly contrary to the formation of a system would also have to be admitted but the decree of the divine wisdom in preserving always the same force and the same total direction has provided for a system i find indeed that many of the effects of nature can be accounted for in a twofold way that is to say by a consideration of efficient causes and again independently by a consideration of final causes an example of the latter is god's decree to always carry out his plan by the easiest and most determined way i have shown this elsewhere in accounting for the catoptric and dioptric laws and i will speak more at length about it in what follows twenty two reconciliation of the two methods of explanation the one using final causes and the other efficient causes thus satisfying both those who explain nature mechanically and those who have recourse to incorporeal natures it is worth while to make the preceding remark in order to reconcile those who hope to explain mechanically the formation of the first tissue of an animal and all the interrelation of the parts with those who account for the same structure by referring to final causes both explanations are good 
both are useful not only for the admiring of the work of a great artificer, but also for the discovery of useful facts in physics and medicine. And writers who take these diverse routes should not speak ill of each other. For I see that those who attempt to explain beauty by the divine anatomy ridicule those who imagine that the apparently fortuitous flow of certain liquids has been able to produce such a beautiful variety, and that they regard them as overbold and irreverent. These others, on the contrary, treat the former as simple and superstitious, and compare them to those ancients who regarded the physicists as impious when they maintained that not Jupiter thundered, but some material which is found in the clouds. The best plan would be to join the two ways of thinking. To use a practical comparison, we recognize and praise the ability of a workman, not only when we show what designs he had in making the parts of his machine, but also when we explain the instruments which he employed in making each part, above all if these instruments are simple and ingeniously contrived. God is also a workman able enough to produce a machine still a thousand times more ingenious than is our body, by employing only certain quite simple liquids purposely composed in such a way that ordinary laws of nature alone are required to develop them so as to produce such a marvellous effect. But it is also true that this development would not take place if God were not the author of nature. Yet I find that the method of efficient causes, which goes much deeper and is in a measure more immediate and a priori, is also more difficult when we come to details, and I think that our philosophers are still very frequently far removed from making the most of this method. The method of final causes, however, is easier and can be frequently employed to find out important and useful truths, which we should have to seek for a long time if we were confined to that other more physical method of which anatomy is able to furnish many examples. It seems to me that Snellius, who was the first discoverer of the laws of refraction, would have waited a long time before finding them if he had wished to seek out first how light was formed. But he apparently followed that method which the ancients employed for catoptrics, that is, the method of final causes. Because, while seeking for the easiest way in which to conduct a ray of light from one given point to another given point by reflection from a given plane, supposing that that was the design of nature, they discovered the equality of the angles of incidence and reflection, as can be seen from a little treatise by Heliodorus of Larissa and also elsewhere. This principle Monsieur Snellius, I believe, and afterwards independently of him Monsieur Fermat, applied most ingeniously to refraction. For since the rays while in the same media always maintain the same proportion of signs, which in turn corresponds to the resistance of the media, it appears that they follow the easiest way, or at least that way which is the most determinate for passing from a given point in one medium to a given point in another medium. That demonstration of this same theorem which M. Descartes has given, using efficient causes, is much less satisfactory. At least we have grounds to think that he would never have found the principle by that means if he had not learned in Holland of the discovery of Snellius. 23. Returning to immaterial substances, we explain how God acts upon the understanding of spirits, and ask whether one always keeps the idea of what he thinks about. I have thought it well to insist a little upon final causes, upon incorporeal natures and upon an intelligent cause with respect to bodies so as to show the use of these conceptions in physics and in mathematics. This for two reasons. First, to purge from mechanical philosophy the impiety that is imputed to it. Second, to elevate to nobler lines of thought, the thinking of our philosophers who incline to materialistic considerations alone. Now, however, it will be well to return from corporeal substances to the consideration of immaterial natures, and particularly of spirits, and to speak of the methods which God uses to enlighten them and to act upon them. Although we must not forget that there are here at the same time certain laws of nature in regard to which I can speak more amply elsewhere, it will be enough for now to touch upon ideas and to inquire if we see everything in God and how God is our light. First of all, it will be in place to remark that the wrong use of ideas occasions many errors. For when one reasons in regard to anything, he imagines that he has an idea of it, and this is the foundation upon which certain philosophers, ancient and modern, have constructed a demonstration of God that is extremely imperfect. It must be, they say, that I have an idea of God, or of a perfect being, since I think of him and we cannot think without having ideas. Now the idea of this being includes all perfections, and since existence is one of these perfections, it follows that he exists. But I reply, inasmuch as we often think of impossible chimeras, 
for example of the highest degree of swiftness of the greatest number of the meeting of the conchoid with its base or determinant such reasoning is not sufficient it is therefore in this sense that we can say that there are true and false ideas according as the thing which is in question is possible or not and it is when he is assured of the possibility of a thing that one can boast of having an idea of it therefore the aforesaid argument proves that god exists if he is possible this is in fact an excellent privilege of the divine nature to have need only of a possibility or an essence in order to actually exist and it is just this which is called ens a se twenty four what clear and obscure distinct and confused adequate and inadequate intuitive and assumed knowledge is and the definition of nominal real causal and essential in order to understand better the nature of ideas it is necessary to touch somewhat upon the various kinds of knowledge when i am able to recognize a thing among others without being able to say in what its differences or characteristics consist the knowledge is confused sometimes indeed we may know clearly that is without being in the slightest doubt that a poem or picture is well or badly done because there is in it an i know not what which satisfies or shocks us such knowledge is not yet distinct it is when i am able to explain the peculiarities that a thing has that the knowledge is called distinct such is the knowledge of an assayer who discerns the true gold from the false by means of certain proofs or marks which make up the definition of gold but distinct knowledge has degrees because ordinarily the conceptions which enter into the definitions will themselves have need of definition and are only known confusedly when at length everything which enters into a definition or into distinct knowledge is known distinctly even back to the primitive conception i call that knowledge adequate when my mind understands at once and distinctly all the primitive ingredients of a conception then we have intuitive knowledge this is extremely rare as most human knowledge is only confused or indeed assumed it is well also to distinguish nominal from real definition I call a definition nominal when there is doubt whether an exact conception of it is possible as for instance when i say that an endless screw is a line in three-dimensional space whose parts are congruent or fall one upon another now although this is one of the reciprocal properties of an endless screw he who did not know from elsewhere what an endless screw was could doubt if such a line were possible because the other lines whose ends are congruent there are only two the circumference of a circle and the straight line are plain figures that is to say they can be described in plano this instance enables us to see that any reciprocal property can serve as a nominal definition but when the property brings us to see the possibility of a thing it makes the definition real and as long as one has only a nominal definition he cannot be sure of the consequences which he draws because if it conceals a contradiction or an impossibility he would be able to draw the opposite conclusions that is why truths do not depend upon names and are not arbitrary as some of our new philosophers think there is also a considerable difference among real definitions for when the possibility proves itself only by experience as in the definition of quicksilver whose possibility we know because such a body which is both an extremely heavy fluid and quite volatile actually exists the definition is merely real and nothing more if however the proof of the possibility is a priori the definition is not only real but also causal as for instance when it contains the possible generation of a thing finally when the definition without assuming anything which requires a proof a priori of its possibility carries the analysis clear to the primitive conception the definition is perfect or essential twenty five in what cases knowledge is added to mere contemplation of the idea now it is manifest that we have no idea of a conception when it is impossible and in case the knowledge where we have the idea of it is only assumed we do not visualize it because such a conception is known only in like manner as conceptions internally impossible and if it be in fact possible it is not by this kind of knowledge that we learn its possibility for instance when i am thinking of a thousand or of a kiliagon i frequently do it without contemplating the idea even if i say a thousand is ten times a hundred i frequently do not trouble to think what ten and a hundred are because i assume that i know and i do not consider it necessary to stop just at present to conceive of them therefore it may well happen as it in fact does happen often enough that i am mistaken in regard to a conception which i assume that i understand although it is an impossible truth or at least is incompatible with others with which i join it 
and whether I am mistaken or not, this way of assuming our knowledge remains the same. It is, then, only when our knowledge is clear in regard to confused conceptions, and when it is intuitive in regard to those which are distinct, that we see its entire idea. 26. Ideas are all stored up within us. Plato's doctrine of reminiscence. In order to see clearly what an idea is, we must guard ourselves against a misunderstanding. Many regard the idea as the form or the differentiation of our thinking, and according to this opinion we have the idea in our mind, insofar as we are thinking of it, and each separate time that we think of it anew, we have another idea although similar to the preceding one. Some, however, take the idea as the immediate object of thought, or as a permanent form which remains even when we are no longer contemplating it. As a matter of fact, our soul has the power of representing to itself any form or nature whenever the occasion comes for thinking about it, and I think that this activity of our soul is, so far as it expresses some nature, form or essence, properly the idea of the thing. This is in us, and is always in us, whether we are thinking of it or no. Our soul expresses God and the universe and all essences as well as all existences. This position is in accord with my principles that naturally nothing enters into our minds from outside. It is a bad habit we have of thinking as though our minds receive certain messengers, as it were, or as if they had doors or windows. We have in our minds all those forms for all periods of time because the mind at every moment expresses all its future thoughts and already thinks confusedly of all that of which it will ever think distinctly. Nothing can be taught us of which we have not already in our minds the idea. This idea is, as it were, the material out of which the thought will form itself. This is what Plato has excellently brought out in his doctrine of reminiscence, a doctrine which contains a great deal of truth, provided that it is properly understood and purged of the error of pre-existence, and provided that one does not conceive of the soul as having already known and thought at some other time what it learns and thinks now. Plato has also confirmed his position by a beautiful experiment. He introduces a small boy, whom he leads by short steps, to extremely difficult truths of geometry, bearing on incommensurables. All this without teaching the boy anything, merely drawing out replies by a well-arranged series of questions. This shows that the soul virtually knows those things, and needs only to be reminded, animadverted, to recognize the truths. Consequently, it possesses at least the idea upon which those truths depend. We may say even that it already possesses those truths, if we consider them as the relations of the ideas. 27. In what respect our souls can be compared to blank tablets, and how conceptions are derived from the senses? Aristotle preferred to compare our souls to blank tablets prepared for writing, and he maintained that nothing is in the understanding which does not come through the senses. This position is in accord with the popular conceptions as Aristotle's positions usually are. Plato thinks more profoundly. Such tenets or practicologies are nevertheless allowable in ordinary use, somewhat in the same way as those who accept the Copernican theory still continue to speak of the rising and setting of the sun. I find indeed that these usages can be given a real meaning containing no error, quite in the same way as I have already pointed out, that we may truly say particular substances act upon one another. In this same sense we may say that knowledge is received from without through the medium of the senses, because certain exterior things contain or express more particularly the causes which determine us to certain thoughts. Because in the ordinary uses of life we attribute to the soul only that which belongs to it most manifestly and particularly, and there is no advantage in going further. When, however, we are dealing with the exactness of metaphysical truths, it is important to recognize the powers and independence of the soul, which extend infinitely further than is commonly supposed. In order, therefore, to avoid misunderstandings, it would be well to choose separate terms for the two. These expressions, which are in the soul, whether one is conceiving of them or not, may be called ideas, while those which one conceives of or constructs may be called conceptions, conceptus. But whatever terms are used, it is always false to say that all our conceptions come from the so-called external senses because those conceptions which I have of myself and of my thoughts, and consequently of being, of substance, of action, of identity, and of many others, came from an inner experience. 28. The only immediate object of our perceptions which exists outside of us is God, and in Him alone is our light. 
In the strictly metaphysical sense, no external cause acts upon us except in God alone, and he is in immediate relation with us only by virtue of our continual dependence upon him. Whence it follows that there is absolutely no other external object which comes into contact with our souls and directly excites perceptions in us. We have in our souls ideas of everything, only because of the continual action of God upon us. That is to say, because every effect expresses its cause and therefore the essences of our souls are certain expressions, imitations or images of the divine essence, divine thought and divine will, including all the ideas which are there contained. We may say, therefore, that God is for us the only immediate external object and that we see things through him. For example, when we see the sun or the stars, it is God who gives to us and preserves in us the ideas, and whenever our senses are affected according to his own laws in a certain manner, it is he who, by his continual concurrence, determines our thinking. God is the sun and the light of souls. Lumen illuminans omnem hominem venientem in hunc mundum although this is not the current conception. I think I have already remarked that during the scholastic period many believed God to be the light of the soul, intellectus agens animae rationalis, following in this the holy scriptures and the fathers who were always more platonic than Aristotelian in their mode of thinking. The Averroists misused this conception, but others, among whom were several mystic theologians, and William of Saint-Amour, also, I think, understood this conception in a manner which assured the dignity of God and was able to raise the soul to a knowledge of its welfare. 29. Yet we think directly by means of our own ideas and not through God's. Nevertheless, I cannot approve of the position of certain able philosophers who seem to hold that our ideas themselves are in God and not at all in us. I think that in taking this position they have neither sufficiently considered the nature of substance which we have just explained, nor the entire extension and independence of the soul, which includes all that happens to it, and expresses God, and with him all possible and actual beings in the same way that an effect expresses its cause. It is indeed inconceivable that the soul should think using the ideas of something else. The soul, when it thinks of anything, must be affected effectively in a certain manner, and it must needs have in itself an advance not only the passive capacity of being thus affected, a capacity already wholly determined, but it must have, besides, an active power by virtue of which it has always had in its nature the marks of the future production of this thought, and the disposition to produce it at its proper time. All of this shows that the soul already includes the idea which is comprised in any particular thought. 30. How God inclines our souls without necessitating them, that there are no grounds for complaint, that we must not ask why Judas sinned because this free act is contained in his concept, the only question being why Judas the sinner is admitted to existence, preferably to other possible persons. Concerning the original imperfection or limitation before the fall, and concerning the different degrees of grace. Regarding the action of God upon the human will, there are many quite different considerations which it would take too long to investigate here. Nevertheless, the following is what can be said in general. God, in cooperating with ordinary actions, only follows the laws which he has established. That is to say, he continually preserves and produces our being so that the ideas come to us spontaneously, or with freedom, in that order which the concept of our individual substance carries with itself. In this concept they can be foreseen for all eternity. Furthermore, by virtue of the decree which God has made that the will shall always seek the apparent good in certain particular respects, in regard to which this apparent good always has in it something of reality expressing or imitating God's will, he, without at all necessitating our choice, determines it by that which appears most desirable. For absolutely speaking, our will as contrasted with necessity is in a state of indifference, being able to act otherwise or wholly to suspend its action, either alternative being and remaining possible. It therefore devolves upon the soul to be on guard against appearances by means of a firm will, to reflect and to refuse to act or decide in certain circumstances, except after mature deliberation. It is, however, true, and has been assured from all eternity, that certain souls will not employ their power upon certain occasions. But who could do more than God has done, and can such a soul complain of anything except itself? All these complaints after the deed are unjust, inasmuch as they would have been unjust before the deed. Would this soul a little before committing the sin have had the right to complain of God as though he had determined the sin? 
since the determinations of God in these matters cannot be foreseen, how would the soul know that it was preordained to sin unless it had already committed the sin? It is merely a question of wishing to or not wishing to, and God could not have set an easier or juster condition. Therefore all judges, without asking the reasons which have disposed a man to have an evil will, consider only how far this will is wrong. But, you object, perhaps it is ordained from all eternity that I will sin. Find your own answer. Perhaps it has not been. Now then, without asking for what you are unable to know, and in regard to which you can have no light, act according to your duty and your knowledge. But someone will object, Whence comes it then that this man will assuredly do this sin? The reply is easy. It is that otherwise he would not be a man. For God foresees from all time that there will be a certain Judas, and in the concept or idea of him which God has is contained this future free act. The only question, therefore, which remains is why this certain Judas, the betrayer who is possible only because of the idea of God, actually exists. To this question, however, we can expect no answer here on earth, excepting to say in general that it is because God has found it good that he should exist, notwithstanding that sin which he foresaw. This evil will be more than overbalanced. God will derive a greater good from it, and it will finally turn out that this series of events in which is included the existence of this sinner is the most perfect among all the possible series of events. An explanation in every case of the admirable economy of this choice cannot be given while we are sojourners on earth. It is enough to know the excellence without understanding it. It is here that must be recognized altitudinem divitiarum, the unfathomable depth of the divine wisdom, without hesitating at a detail which involves an infinite number of considerations. It is clear, however, that God is not the cause of ill, for not only after the loss of innocence by men has original sin possessed the soul, but even before that there was an original limitation or imperfection in the very nature of all creatures, which rendered them open to sin and able to fall. There is therefore no more difficulty in the supralapsarian view than there is in the other views of sin. To this also, it seems to me, can be reduced the opinion of St. Augustine and of other authors that the root of evil is in the negativity, that is to say, in the lack or limitation of creatures which God graciously remedies by whatever degree of perfection it pleases him to give. This grace of God, whether ordinary or extraordinary, has its degrees and its measures. It is always efficacious in itself to produce a certain proportionate effect, and furthermore it is always sufficient not only to keep one from sin, but even to effect his salvation, provided that the man cooperates with that which is in him. It has not always, however, sufficient power to overcome the inclination, for if it did, it would no longer be limited in any way, and this superiority to limitations is reserved to that unique grace which is absolutely efficacious. This grace is always victorious, whether through its own self or through the congruity of circumstances. 31. Concerning the motives of election, concerning faith foreseen and the absolute decree, and that it all reduces to the question why God has chosen and resolved to admit to existence just such a possible person, whose concept includes just such a sequence of free acts and of free gifts of grace. This at once puts an end to all difficulties. Finally, the grace of God is wholly unprejudiced and creatures have no claim upon it. Just as it is not sufficient in accounting for God's choice in his dispensations of grace, to refer to his absolute or conditional prevision of men's future actions, so it is also wrong to imagine his decrees as absolute, with no reasonable motive. As concerns foreseen faith and good works, it is very true that God has selected none but those whose faith and charity he foresees. Quos se fide donatorum prescivit? The same question, however, arises again as to why God gives to some rather than to others the grace of faith or of good works. As concerns God's ability to foresee not only the faith and good deeds, but also their material and predisposition, or that which a man on his part contributes to them, since there are as truly diversities on the part of men as on the part of grace, and a man, although he needs to be aroused to good and needs to become converted, yet acts in accordance with his temperament. As regards his ability to foresee, there are many who say that God, knowing what a particular man will do without grace, that is, without his extraordinary assistance, or knowing at least what will be the human contribution, resolves to give grace to those whose natural dispositions are the best, or at any rate are the least imperfect and evil. 
but if this were the case then the natural dispositions in so far as they were good would be like gifts of grace since god would have given advantages to some over others and therefore since he would well know that the natural advantages which he had given would serve as motives for his grace or for his extraordinary assistance would not everything be reduced to his mercy i think therefore that since we do not know how much and in what way god regards natural dispositions in the dispensations of his grace it would be safest and most exact to say in accordance with our principles and as i have already remarked that there must needs be among possible beings the person peter or john whose concept or idea contains all that particular sequence of ordinary and extraordinary manifestations of grace together with the rest of the accompanying events and circumstances and that it has pleased god to choose him among an infinite number of persons equally possible for actual existence when we have said this there seems nothing left to ask and all difficulties vanish for in regard to that great and ultimate question why it has pleased god to choose him among so great a number of possible persons it is surely unreasonable to demand more than the general reasons which we have given the reasons in detail surpass our ken therefore instead of postulating an absolute decree which being without reason would be unreasonable and instead of postulating reasons which do not succeed in solving the difficulties and in turn have need themselves of reasons it will be best to say with st paul that there are for god's choice certain great reasons of wisdom and congruity which he follows which reasons however are unknown to mortals and are founded upon the general order whose goal is the greatest perfection of the world this is what is meant when the motives of god's glory and of the manifestation of his justice are spoken of as well as when men speak of his mercy and his perfection in general that immense vastness of wealth in fine with which the soul of the same saint paul was so thrilled 32 usefulness of these principles in matters of piety and of religion in addition it seems that the thoughts which we have just explained and particularly the great principle of the perfection of god's operations and the concept of substance which includes all its changes with all its accompanying circumstances far from injuring serve rather to confirm religion serve to dissipate great difficulties to inflame souls with a divine love and to raise the mind to a knowledge of incorporeal substances much more than the present day hypotheses for it appears clearly that all other substances depend upon god just as our thoughts emanate from our own substances that god is all in all and that he is intimately united to all created things in proportion however to their perfection that it is he alone who determines them from without by his influence and if to act is to determine directly it may be said in metaphysical language that god alone acts upon me and he alone causes me to do good or ill other substances contributing only because of his determinations because god who takes all things into consideration distributes his bounties and compels created beings to accommodate themselves to one another thus god alone constitutes the relation or communication between substances it is through him that the phenomena of the one meet and accord with the phenomena of the others so that there may be a reality in our perceptions in common parlance however an action is attributed to particular causes in the sense that i have explained above because it is not necessary to make continual mention of the universal cause when speaking of particular cases it can be seen also that every substance has a perfect spontaneity which becomes liberty with intelligent substances everything which happens to it is a consequence of its idea or its being and nothing determines it except god only it is for this reason that a person of exalted mind and revered saintliness may say that the soul ought often to think as if there were only god and itself in the world nothing can make us hold to immortality more firmly than this independence and vastness of the soul which protects it completely against exterior things since it alone constitutes our universe and together with god is sufficient for itself it is as impossible for it to perish save through annihilation as it is impossible for the universe to destroy itself the universe whose animate and perpetual expression it is furthermore the changes in this extended mass which is called our body cannot possibly affect the soul nor can the dissipation of the body destroy that which is indivisible thirty three explanation of the relation between the soul and the body a matter which has been regarded as inexplicable or else as miraculous concerning the origin of confused perceptions we can also see the explanation of that great mystery the union of the soul and the body 
that is to say how it comes about that the passions and actions of the one are accompanied by the actions and passions or else the appropriate phenomena of the other for it is not possible to conceive how one can have an influence upon the other and it is unreasonable to have recourse at once to the extraordinary intervention of the universal cause in an ordinary and particular case the following however is the true explanation we have said that everything which happens to a soul or to any substance is a consequence of its concept hence the idea itself or the essence of the soul brings it about that all of its appearances or perceptions should be born out of its nature and precisely in such a way that they correspond of themselves to that which happens in the universe at large but more particularly and more perfectly to that which happens in the body associated with it because it is in a particular way and only for a certain time according to the relation of other bodies to its own body that the soul expresses the state of the universe this last fact enables us to see how our body belongs to us without however being attached to our essence i believe that those who are careful thinkers will decide favorably for our principles because of this single reason namely that they are able to see in what consists the relation between the soul and the body a parallelism which appears inexplicable in any other way we can also see that the perceptions of our senses even when they are clear must necessarily contain certain confused elements for as all the bodies in the universe are in sympathy ours receives the impressions of all the others and while our senses respond to everything our soul cannot pay attention to every particular that is why our confused sensations are the result of a variety of perceptions this variety is infinite it is almost like the confused murmuring which is heard by those who approach the shore of a sea it comes from the continual beatings of innumerable waves if now out of the many perceptions which do not at all fit together to make one no particular one perception surpasses the others and if they make impressions about equally strong or equally capable of holding the attention of the soul they can be perceived only confusedly thirty four concerning the difference between spirits and other substances souls or substantial forms that the immortality which men desire includes memory supposing that the bodies which constitute a unum per se as human bodies are substances and have substantial forms and supposing that animals have souls we are obliged to grant that these souls and these substantial forms cannot entirely perish any more than can the atoms or the ultimate elements of matter according to the position of other philosophers for no substance perishes although it may become very different such substances also express the whole universe although more imperfectly than do spirits the principal difference however is that they do not know that they are nor what they are consequently not being able to reason they are unable to discover necessary and universal truths it is also because they do not reflect regarding themselves that they have no moral qualities whence it follows that undergoing a thousand transformations as we see a caterpillar change into a butterfly the result from a moral or practical standpoint is the same as if we said that they perished in each case and we can indeed say it from the physical standpoint in the same way that we say bodies perish in their dissolution but the intelligent soul knowing that it is and having the ability to say that word i so full of meaning not only continues and exists metaphysically far more certainly than do the others but it remains the same from the moral standpoint and constitutes the same personality for it is its memory or knowledge of this ego which renders it open to punishment and reward also the immortality which is required in morals and in religion does not consist merely in this perpetual existence which pertains to all substances for if in addition there were no remembrance of what one had been immortality would not be at all desirable suppose that some individual could suddenly become king of china on condition however of forgetting what he had been as though being born again would it not amount to the same practically or as far as the effects could be perceived as if the individual were annihilated and a king of china were the same instant created in his place the individual would have no reason to desire this thirty five the excellence of spirits that god considers them preferable to other creatures that the spirits express god rather than the world while other simple substances express the world rather than god in order however to prove by natural reasons that god will preserve forever not only our substance but also our personality that is to say the recollection and knowledge of what we are although the distinct knowledge is sometimes suspended during sleep and in swoons it is necessary to join to metaphysics moral considerations 
God must be considered not only as the principle and the cause of all substances and of all existing things, but also as the chief of all persons or intelligent substances, as the absolute monarch of the most perfect city or republic, such as is constituted by all the spirits together in the universe, God being the most complete of all spirits at the same time that he is greatest of all beings. For assuredly the spirits are the most perfect of substances and best express the divinity. Since all the nature, purpose, virtue and function of substances is, as has been sufficiently explained, to express God and the universe, there is no room for doubting that those substances which give the expression, knowing what they are doing and which are able to understand the great truths about God and the universe, do express God and the universe incomparably better than do those natures which are either brutish and incapable of recognizing truths, or are wholly destitute of sensation and knowledge. The difference between intelligent substances and those which are not intelligent is quite as great as between a mirror and one who sees. As God is himself the greatest and wisest of spirits, it is easy to understand that the spirits with which he can, so to speak, enter into conversation and even into social relations by communicating to them in particular ways his feelings and his will, so that they are able to know and love their benefactor, must be much nearer to him than the rest of created things which may be regarded as the instruments of spirits. In the same way we see that all wise persons consider far more the condition of a man than of anything else, however precious it may be. And it seems that the greatest satisfaction which a soul satisfied in other respects can have is to see itself loved by others. However, with respect to God, there is this difference that his glory and our worship can add nothing to his satisfaction, the recognition of creatures being nothing but a consequence of his sovereign and perfect felicity, and being far from contributing to it, or from causing it even in part. Nevertheless, that which is reasonable in finite spirits is found eminently in him, and as we praise a king who prefers to preserve the life of a man before that of the most precious and rare of his animals, we should not doubt that the most enlightened and most just of all monarchs has the same preference. 36. God is the monarch of the most perfect republic, composed of all the spirits, and the happiness of this city of God is his principal purpose. Spirits are, of all substances, the most capable of perfection, and their perfections are different in this, that they interfere with one another the least, or rather that they aid one another the most, for only the most virtuous can be the most perfect friends. Hence it follows that God, who in all things has the greatest perfection, will have the greatest care for spirits, and will give not only to all of them in general, but even to each one in particular, the highest perfection which the universal harmony will permit. We can even say that it is because he is a spirit that God is the originator of existences. For if he lacked the power of will to choose what is best, there would have been no reason why one possible being should exist rather than any other. Therefore God's being a spirit himself dominates all the consideration which he may have toward created things. Spirits alone are made in his image, being as it were of his blood or as children in the family, since they alone are able to serve him of free will and to act consciously, imitating the divine nature. A single spirit is worth a whole world because it not only expresses the whole world, but it also knows it and governs itself as does God. In this way we may say that though every substance expresses the whole universe, yet the other substances express the world rather than God, while spirits express God rather than the world. This nature of spirits, so noble that it enables them to approach divinity as much as is possible for created things, has as a result that God derives infinitely more glory from them than from the other beings, or rather the other beings furnish to spirits the material for glorifying him. This moral quality of God which constitutes him lord and monarch of spirits influences him, so to speak, personally and in a unique way. It is through this that he humanizes himself, that he is willing to suffer anthropologies, and that he enters into social relations with us, and this consideration is so dear to him that the happy and prosperous condition of his empire, which consists in the greatest possible felicity of its inhabitants, becomes supreme among his laws. Happiness is to persons what perfection is to beings. And if the dominant principle in the existence of the physical world is the decree to give it the greatest possible perfection, the primary purpose in the moral world, or in the city of God, which constitutes the noblest part of the universe, ought to be to extend the greatest happiness possible. We must not therefore doubt that God has so ordained everything that spirits not only shall live forever, because this is unavoidable, but that they shall also preserve forever their moral quality, so that his city may never lose a person, quite in the same way that the world never loses a substance. 
Consequently, they will always be conscious of their being, otherwise they would be open to neither reward nor punishment, a condition which is the essence of a republic, and above all of the most perfect republic where nothing can be neglected. In fine, God being at the same time the most just and the most debonair of monarchs, and requiring only a good will on the part of men, provided that it be sincere and intentional, his subjects cannot desire a better condition. To render them perfectly happy he desires only that they love him. 37. Jesus Christ has revealed to men the mystery and the admirable laws of the kingdom of heaven, and the greatness of the supreme happiness which God has prepared for those who love him. The ancient philosophers knew very little of these important truths. Jesus Christ alone has expressed them divinely well, and in a way so clear and simple that the dullest minds have understood them. His gospel has entirely changed the face of human affairs. It has brought us to know the kingdom of heaven, or that perfect republic of spirits which deserves to be called the city of God. He it is who has discovered to us its wonderful laws. He alone has made us see how much God loves us and with what care everything that concerns us has been provided for. How God, inasmuch as he cares for the sparrows, will not neglect reasoning beings who are infinitely more dear to him. How all the hairs of our heads are numbered. How heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God and that which belongs to the means of our salvation will not pass away. How God has more regard for the least one among intelligent souls than for the whole machinery of the world. How he ought not to fear those who are able to destroy the body, but are unable to destroy the soul, since God alone can render the soul happy or unhappy. And how the souls of the righteous are protected by his hand against all the upheavals of the universe, since God alone is able to act upon them. How none of our acts are forgotten, how everything is to be accounted for, even careless words and even a spoonful of water which is well used. In fact, how everything must result in the greatest welfare of the good. For then shall the righteous become like sons, and neither our sense nor our minds have ever tasted of anything approaching the joys which God has laid up for those that love him. End of section 2 End of Discourse on Metaphysics by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Translated by George Montgomery